<coughs> Alright, well, here we are. We finally got the uh, streaming software ready to go. And we'll be able to talk about uh, whatever it is we're going to talk about today. Welcome, everyone. I'm Matt Line, And this is uh, Calling Sacred Cows. Hopefully we've got all of the technical uh, details sorted out. Anyhow, the topic is getting a classical education. Uh, and then we're going to look at the Iliad Book 1 uh, lines <coughs> 1 through <coughs> Please excuse me, 1 uh, through 182. If you're interested <coughs> if you're interested in following along I put up a bunch of slides with it uh, with the original uh, translated text on SlideShare uh, it's the uh, William Cowper translation from the 18th century it is in pentameter right, we are reading the poetry as opposed to the prose and we're going to be taking a look at this in order to see how and why the Iliad is important. Now the reason that we're doing this is because I've been figuring, well, what are the important things that we could possibly go through? Like, why, why would, for example, a liberal arts education be useful? And I'll admit that for the longest time I wound up having a poor idea, a bad view, a, a, a an absolutely horrible picture of a liberal arts education because the only examples that I ever had were those of the late modern era, those of present day. And they were supposed to turn me and they're supposed to turn you, and they're supposed to turn everybody into progressives. And that is quite simply not the case. Indeed, uh, it was largely a liberal arts education and being able to understand certain things that were able to bring some really, really amazing countries and ideas and, and things about. So... If you guys are interested in following along, I would say let's get started <clears throat> in reading Homer's Iliad and discussing a bit about the context. <coughs> First off, we're going to be talking about Book 1, Lines 1 through 182. But before we get into that, we're going to talk about uh, the Sack of Troy. So this is a, an epic poem in the setting of the sacking of Troy. So we are to assume that there was a guy named Achilles. Uh, we, are, we are to assume there was Agamemnon and Patroclus and uh, Paris and all these other different people. Now, of course, their dyna the dynamic in, of the interaction between them might have been reduced over the years from what it was to... You know something epic it might have had a, a bit of the nuance eliminated in order to get to the core of what the interactions in between the characters entailed but that is actually one of the best things about good literature is good literature resonates with human beings good literature has a ring of truth to it whatever it may be and so a lot of what is superfluous passes away especially when it is in the form of oral tradition as was the Iliad and so when we are looking at the Iliad we're actually going to be doing it for a couple of different things we're going to be looking at uh, character arc 
we're going to be looking at character development. I mean, and I would say that, you know, the characters in the Iliad aren't nearly as, um, uh, they don't go through nearly the same kind of an arc as, for example, Odysseus or Ulysses in the Odyssey, but the character arc is still there. The story arc, you know, how all the characters and all the elements go together to cause something to happen, that's also a very important thing to look at. And in understanding the character arc and the story arc, we're going to hopefully come to a better understanding, or at least an implicit one, and perhaps in some ways an explicit one, of human nature. Of human nature. And if our goal is to understand human beings, then that will allow us also to function better in a world comprised of human beings. So... This is just the first of many steps that it takes or that we are going to go through in order to get a classical education. If any of you are interested, uh, you're more than welcome to uh, uh, chime in in the chat. I'm going to be, uh, since I only have one screen, I'm going to be popping back in between the, um, <coughs> the streaming software YouTube chat and slide share. So slide two of 20, the argument of the first book. This book opens with an account of a pestilence, <coughs> a pestilence that prevailed in the Grecian camp. And the cause of it is assigned. A council is called in which fierce altercation takes place between Agamemnon and Achilles. The latter, that is Achilles, solemnly renounces the field, the battlefield. Agamemnon, by his heralds, demands Perseus and Achilles resigns her. He makes his complete complaint to Thetis, that's Achilles' mom, who undertakes to plead his cause with Jupiter, that would also be Zeus. She pleads it and prevails, and the book concludes with an account of what passed in heaven on that occasion. <coughs> heaven, of course, being up in uh, Olympus, up in the sky, where all the uh, where all the gods were. Uh, for a little bit of context, people back then, most of them were polytheists, and so a lot of the unexplainable things uh, were explained by gods. So that's something that we kind of have to uh, humor while going through this. Uh, Felton summarizes the book by saying, This first book contains the preliminaries to the commencement of serious action. So in other words, I, I'll go and say, this is you're, We're starting in medias res, in the middle of the situation. We're starting in the middle of, of, of everything. Like you have to be going and put in, being put into some kind of context. And so that's what book one does. It contextualizes the rest of the story. So first, the visit of the priest of Apollo to ransom his captive daughter, the refusal of Agamemnon to yield her up, and the pestilence sent by the god that is Apollo upon the Grecian army in consequence. Secondly, the restoration, the propitiation of Apollo, the quarrel of Agamemnon and Achilles, and the withdrawing of the latter, Achilles, from the Grecian army. Thirdly, the intercession of Thetis with Jupiter. His promise, that is Jupiter's promise, unwillingly given to avenge Achilles, and the assembly of the gods, in which the promise is angry alluded to by Juno, and the discussion preemptorily checked by Jupiter. The poet throughout this book maintains a simple, unadorned style, but highly descriptive and happily adapted to the nature of the subject. <clears throat> so we just call this book one, but this, this, this book has generally been known as the Wrath of Achilles. The Wrath of Achilles. So... This is the story by which, or wherein, Achilles was wronged. Uh, he was stiffed, he was slighted, he was put into a bad position. So they had been 
uh, warring and as spoils of war uh, Achilles got um, uh, Briseis and uh, Agamemnon got Chryseis and then this ultimately wound up becoming a question of okay Agamemnon wants Achilles girl now that Agamemnon can't have his own because of a whole bunch of plagues and crap like that all the reason for this stuff aside, all the God stuff aside, I think that there's a lot to be learned about human interaction. And if all I can do here is state the obvious, well, that means you're in a very good position. I may go through these things precept by precept, and I may belabor, belabor obvious points. But the reason that I'm doing that is so that we can come to a better understanding of what's going on. I would rather belabor an obvious point, and I would rather you bring up an obvious point in chat than have it go unmentioned. I mean, that's why we're only doing 180, whatever it is, 182 lines. I mean, the first book is over 700. So, you know, we're going to take our time with this. It'll probably take us, you know, half a year to get through the book. You know, at the rate of five uh, five uh, days a week, going through it a little bit, but that's okay. It's perfectly okay. Hey, David. Hello, Justin. Very good to see you all. Now you get to hear. I'm going to blow my nose, and then I'm going to attempt to read prose. I'm sorry. I'm going to attempt to read poetry, and sound good doing it. So you guys can laugh at me if you want. Because I've never been very much of a poet. Or perhaps I am a poet and I didn't even know it. I don't know. We'll go and see something along that, along those lines. <coughs> okay. Here we go. We're about uh, 12 minutes and 27 seconds into the stream. And I'll put that there as a mark for anyone that wants to know where the actual book begins. Achilles sing, O goddess Peleus' son. His wrath pernicious, who ten thousand woes. Caused to Achaea's host, sent many a soul, illustrious into Hades premature. And heroes gave, so stood the will of Jove. To dogs and to all ravening fowls a prey. When fierce dispute had separated once, The noble chief Achilles from the son Of Atreus, Agamemnon, king of men. So we understand through this first stanza That the son of Peleus, who is Achilles, is going to be singing out of his wrath. So 10,000, in, in old literature, we talk uh, in, in lots of superlatives. Indeed, exaggeration is a big part of effective communication. Exaggeration, who 10,000 woes. No, it's, it's not. It's not even thousands upon that. It could be. It's not even a thousand. Wolves, it's just ten thousand wolves. It's not thousands. It's thousands upon thousands. It's 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 ten times a thousand. Uh, so so he's miffed. Achilles is really really miffed. He is full of wrath. And apparently, because he was wrathful, he quit the army. And uh, upon him quitting the army, upon there being pestilence, all these different things happening, the Greeks were getting the short end of the stick. The Trojans were at an advantage in their war. So in Heroes Gave, so stood the will of Jove, that would be Jupiter, that would be um, Zeus, 
to dogs and to all ravening fowls a prey. So it, it wasn't even... It, it, the, the big subject of this book isn't even a battle. The big subject of this book is the plague. Uh, that just w w was wiping through the Grecian army. So this sets the context for lines 10 through 18, slide 5. Who them to strife impelled what power divine? Latona's son, and Jove's, for he incensed, Against the king a foul contagion raised, In all the host and multitudes destroyed, For that the son of Atreus had his priest, Dishonored, Chryses to the fleet he came, Bearing rich ransom glorious to redeem, His daughter, and his hands charged with the wreath, and golden scepter of the god shaft armed. And if we look, we can see uh, we have a we have a footnote after uh, after Jove. Latona's son and Jove's. Jove and Latona had a son. His name was Apollo. Uh, he was the tutelary deity of the Dorians. The Dorians had not, however, at this early age become the predominant race in Greece proper. They had spread along the eastern shores of the archipelago into the islands, especially Crete, and had everywhere signalized themselves by the temples of Apollo, of which there seems to have been many in and about Troy. These temples were schools of art and proved the Dorians to have been both intellectual and powerful. Homer was an Ionian and therefore not deeply acquainted with the nature of the Dorian god. But to a mind like his, the god of a people so cultivated and associated with what was most grand in art, must have been an imposing being. And we find him so represented. Throughout the Iliad, he, that is Apollo, appears and acts with splendor and effect, but always against the Greeks, from mere partiality to Hector. It would perhaps be too much to say that in this partiality to Hector, we detect the spirit of the Dorian worship, the only paganism of antiquity that tended to perfect the individual, Apollo being the expression of the moral harmony of the universe and the great spirit of the Dorian culture being to make a perfect man, an incarnation of the cosmos. This Homer could only have known intuitively. In making Apollo author of the plague, he was confounded with Helios, which was frequently, which was frequent afterward, but is not seen elsewhere in Homer. The arrows of Apollo were silent as light, and their emblem, the sun's rays. The analogies are multitudinous between the natural and intellectual sun, but Helios and Apollo were two. And then we go to the Golden Scepter note. There is something exceedingly venerable in the appearance of the priest. He comes with the ensigns of the gods to whom he belongs, with a laurel wreath to show that he was a suppliant and a golden scepter, which the ancients gave in particular to Apollo as they did one of silver to Diana. So he's dressed up in all of his priestly garments, uh, that is, uh, Chrysis, uh, is, is coming to Agamemnon, is coming to Achilles to ask for his daughter back. He's asking for Chryseis. Of course, not Briseis. So Agamemnon's girl. Uh, and Agamemnon loved her, didn't want to let her go. But 
apparently winds up throughout the course of this book coming to the conclusion that's what he's going to need to do. But how does this take place? Lines 19 through 27. His, that is Chrissy's, his supplication was at large to all. The host of Greece, but most of all to two, the sons of Atreus, highest in command. Ye gallant chiefs, and ye their gallant host, so may the gods who in Olympus dwell, give Priam's treasures to you for a spoil, and ye return in safety, take my gifts, and loose my child in honor of the son of Jove, Apollo, archer of the skies. So the art of this speech is remarkable. Chryses considers the army of Greeks as made up of troops, partly from the kingdoms and partly from democracies, and therefore begins with a distinction that includes all. The gallant chiefs and ye their gallant host. Then, as priest of Apollo, he prays that they may obtain the two blessings they most desire. The conquest of Troy and a safe return. So may the gods who in Olympus dwell give Priam's treasures to you for a spoil, and ye return in safety. As he names his petition, he offers an extraordinary ransom and concludes with bidding them fear the god if they refuse it. Like one who, from his office, seems to foretell their misery and exhorts them to shun it. Thus he endeavors to work by the art of a general application, by religion, by interest, and the insinuation of danger. And herein we find another learning point. If we continue to read, and when we continue to read, the, um, the, 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 what Chrissy's was saying, we realized that it was compelling. Oh, certainly not a, not a text made to be speed read, Daniel G00. Certainly not. So, in going through this, the way that the way that uh, the way that we're going through this, we find that his speech was compelling because in line twenty-eight, at once the voice of all was to respect the priest and to accept the bounteous price, but so it pleased not Atreus' mighty son who with rude threatening stem him thence dismissed. Or stern him thence dismissed. So, Chrissy's petition, Chrissy's plea, fell ultimately on deaf ears, though it was compelling, though it contained all that it took to convince an ancient, though it contained the general application and supplication by religion, by interest, and by the insinuation of danger. So it's basically, okay, uh, this is what you hold sacred by, uh, by by the gods. May they may they bless you. May they do this. Uh, you know, uh, here is a bounty for you. And by the way, uh, just do realize that these gods are kind of powerful. Uh, you know. You know, kind of, kind of like, uh, like a mafia. It's like, uh, just, you know, if you don't pay your dues, I can't guarantee you protection. So there's this uh, appeal to self-interest, both in the positive and in the negative sense, uh, in that you would get a, uh, you know, positive reinforcement for good behavior, and positive punishment for bad behavior. And if you need to go look those up, you can find those in any psychology text. 
a positive reinforcement means giving of some sort of reinforcement in the case of doing things right and positive punishment would be uh, giving some sort of punishment in the case of doing wrong so all of these very human elements are brought to light and are used very effectively in lines 19 through 31 of the first book of the Iliad. So it pleased not Atreus' mighty son, who with rude threatenings stern him thence dismissed. And here is the dismissal. Beware, old man, that at these hollow barks I find thee not now lingering or henceforth, returning lest the garland of thy god and his bright scepter should avail thee not. I will not loose thy daughter till old age, steal on her from her native country far. In Argos in my palace she shall ply the loom and shall be partner of my bed. Move me no more, be gone hence while thou. There will be nine lines of no. So, beware, old man, that at these hollow barks I find thee not now lingering or henceforth returning, lest the garland of thy god and his bright scepter should avail thee not. I will not loose thy daughter till old age, steal on her from her native country far. In Argos, in my palace, she shall ply. The lumen shall be partner of my bed, Move me no more, be gone, hence while thou mayest. And then he spake, the old priest trembled and obeyed. Forlorn he roamed the ocean sounding shore, and solitary with much prayer his king, bright hair, Latona's son, Phoebus, implored. So Homer is frequently eloquent in his silence. Chrissy says not a word in answer to the insults of Agamemnon, but walks pensively along the shore. The melancholy flowing out of the verse admirably expresses the condition of the mournful and deserted father. You have to remember here, Chrissy's is doing all he can to get his daughter back. You know, he's, he's using what gifts he does have, his, his wealth and his uh, oratory ability. He's using his, he, he's using his skill set and it wasn't enough. It just wasn't enough. And so when Agamemnon spake, the old priest trembled and obeyed. And if any of you are interested, I um, I probably should mention again that you can open in another tab the slides. Uh, I I put a link to them in the description. Also, it's possible to subscribe to the channel, upvote, and do all the different things that'll get this video more views. That would also be very very nice. Not necessary, but nice. So here we have lines 45 through 52, slide 10 out of 20. God of the silver bow who with thy power, and circlest Chrysa and who reignest supreme, and Tenedos and Cilia the divine, Smithnian Apollo if, er ad, if I error adorned, thy beauteous fame or on the altar burned, the fat acceptable of bulls or goats. Grant my petition with thy shafts avenge on the Achaean host thy servant's tears. So this would be ultimately the prayer of Chrysis. God of the silver bow. That would be Apollo, who with thy power encircles Chrysa. So, so, um, Chryses and Chryseis, they are from Chrysa. And who reigneth supreme in Tenedos and Cilia, the divine. 
Sminthian Apollo, if error, if if I error adorned, thy beauty is fain or on the altar burnt, the fat acceptable. So he's bringing up all these past things. I've been giving you these offerings. I've been giving you these things. Uh, avenge me. Avenge me. And apparently this petition works. Uh, Apollo is known also as the mouse god. So the general idea of, of this is that if you make supplication to Apollo, that somehow um, he will bring plague and pestilence, uh, of which, of course, mice are a sign, on one's enemies. So such prayer he made, and it was heard, the god, down from Olympus with his radiant bow, and his full quiver o'er his shoulder slung, marched in his anger shaken as he moved his rattling arrows told of his approach gloomy he came as night sat from the ships apart and sent an arrow clanged the cord dread sounding bounding on the silver bow mules first and dogs he struck but at themselves dispatching soon his bitter arrows keen smote them Death piles on all sides always blazed. Nine days throughout the camp his arrows flew. The tenth Achilles from all parts convened. The host in council Juno, the white-armed, moved at the sight of Grecians all around. Dying imparted to his mind the thought. The full assembly therefore now convened. Uprose Achilles ardent and began. <laughs> Ah, good point, Legolas. Very good point. I subscribe only for 18 small payments of 19.99. Ah, well, you're more than welcome to uh, donate uh, Bitcoin or donate on PayPal. But um, right now isn't really the time to talk about that. Right now is the time to talk about. Okay, so 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 um, Chrissy's makes supplication. And Apollo rains his stinging arrows. He rains his arrows upon the Greeks. And it uh, manifests itself. In, he rains his stinging arrows on the Greeks. It manifests itself in form of plagues. See how good I am at... Uh, <laughs> poetry. I'm not... So anyhow, the, the plague uh, hits the Greeks. And so, as ancient Greeks would do, they go and they figure, okay, we're, we're having a plague. Clearly there must be a problem. Let's go and solve it. So Achilles goes and tries to do something about it. Atreides, now it seems no course remains for us but that the seas roaming again. We hence return, at least if we survive, but haste consult we quick some prophet here, or priest, or even interpreter of dreams, for dreams are also of Jove that we may learn. By what crime we have thus incensed Apollo, what broken vow, what hecatomb unpaid, he charges on us, and if soothed with steam, of lambs or goats unblemished he may yet be one to spare us and avert the plague. So at least Achilles knew enough to associate this plague with Apollo. And probably had this sinking idea that, you know, it may have very well been the whole uh, Chryseis incident that, 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 that sparked it. So that's the line that, that they would then go and investigate and hopefully figure out if somebody... Who knows what they're talking about? You know, someone of the priestly class would come and explain the situation and say, okay, this is how we rectify it. The situation itself be rectified. I don't know. Ah. 
So he spake and sat when Thestor's son arose, Calchas an augur, foremost in his art, who all things present, past, and future knew, and whom his skill in prophecy, a gift, conferred by Phoebus on him, had advanced to be conductor of the fleet to Troy. He prudent them admonishing replied. So he has no political power, he commands little reverence, and in Agamemnon's treatment of him, as well as Chrissy's, is seen the relation of the re religion to the government. It was either it, it was neither its master nor its slave. So anyhow, um, here we have uh, Calchas coming up and saying, Jove loved Achilles, wouldst thou learn from me? What cause hath moved Apollo to this wrath? The shaft-armed king, I shall divulge the cause, but thou swear first and covenant on thy part, that speaking, acting, thou wilt stand prepared to give me succor, for I judge amiss, or he who rules the Argives the supreme, or all Achaia's host will be incensed. Woe to the man who shall provoke the king, for if to-day he smother close his wrath, he harbors still the vengeance, and in time performs it. Answer, therefore, wilt thou save me? To whom Achilles, swiftest of the swift, what thou hast learnt in secret from the god, that speak and boldly by the son of Jove, Apollo, whom thou Calchas seekest in prayer, made for the Danae, and who, and who thy soul, fills with futurity in all the host. The Grecian lives not who while I shall breathe, and see the light of day shall in this camp oppress thee. No, not even if thou name him Agamemnon, sovereign o'er us all. Then was the seer emboldened, and he spake, Nor vow nor hecatomb unpaid on us. He charges but the wrong done to his priest, Whom Agamemnon slighted when he sought, His daughter's freedom and his gifts refused. He is the cause, Apollo, for his sake, Afflicts and will afflict us neither end nor intermission of his heavy scourge, granting till unredeemed no price required, the black-eyed maid be to her father sent, and a whole hecatomb in Chrysa bleed. Then not before the god may be appeased. So, the solution posed is... Give back Chryseis to Chryses and put together a, pro a propitiatory offering. So, so sat attempt to satisfy Apollo with a hecatomb. Attempt to satisfy him with an offering to be offered in the temple of Apollo. Send the girl back and hopefully you stop angering Apollo's priest, and then get the plague lifted. I mean, that's how people acted in those days. We go and put, When we don't have control over things, we petition gods. And they may or may not hear our prayer, but we do our part in petitioning them. And so, he spake and sat when Atreus' son arose, the hero Agamemnon throned supreme. Tempests of black resentment overcharged. His heart and indignation fired his eyes. On Calchas lowering him he first addressed. So, I'm going to, to, to back up a little bit and say that I love how they introduce each speaker. Because in the verse, in the poetry, when speakers... In poetry, when speakers are addressed, uh, 
you wind up having the emotional tone the uh, you, you you can almost if, if you use your imagination envision the body language that Agamemnon might have had here tempest of black resentment overcharged so you know that his his voice is going to be lower it's going to be full of anger his heart and indignation fired his eyes you know there's going to be a particular expression that he carries and you know that every word is going to be pointing because it's addressed specifically on calcus so when you don't have anything other than poetry when you don't have anything other than the word uh, to bring these ideas forth you have to make it descriptive you have to make it good and you bring in other senses as you write you bring in other senses as you speak you don't just state things as if they were fact you spin them you make them tangible you make them palpable you make them understandable and in making it tangible and palpable and understandable you wind up giving this much more full and rich piece to whoever's listening and that's another lesson we can learn from ancient literature the lesson we can learn is that whatever we have to say we say it in such a way as to engender the intended response. We may wind up taking extra time to do this. We may wind up taking extra time to make things tangible. We may wind up taking extra time to make things a story. But that is the difference in between an epic poem and something that fades into obscurity. That is the difference between getting your message across and having it resound with a listener and having it fall on flat ears, even if this is not compelling to you per se. This is compelling. This, this style is compelling to humanity at large. And so, I suggest that that's one of the many lessons to be learned and also in reading the Iliad like this we may wind up getting elements of story arcs and character arcs and little glimpses into human nature that we might not have otherwise have gotten I know it's a very bold claim for me to make. But if we go and pick these things apart, we see that people have always acted in particular ways. And this gets to the heart of them. Agamemnon is incensed. His heart and indignation fired his eyes on calchas lowering him he first addressed prophet of mischief from whose tongue no note of grateful sound to me was ever heard ill tidings are thy joy and tidings glad thou tellest not or thy words come not to pass and now among the dane thy dreams divulging thou pretendest the archer god for his priest's sake our enemy because i scorned his offer Ransom of the maid, Chryseis more desirous far to bear, her to my home, for that she charms me more, than Clymnestra my own first espoused, with whom in disposition, feature, form, accomplishments she may be well compared, yet being such I will return her hence, if that she go be best, perish myself, but let the people of my charge be saved, Prepare ye therefore a reward for me, and seek it instant, it were much unmeet, that I alone of all the Argive host 
should want due recompense whose former prize is elsewhere destined as ye all perceive. So, Atreus' son, Agamemnon, is incensed. The su uh, it's, he, he's incensed, and he's like, Well, I may be in charge here, but you're going to make it worth my time to make this sacrifice. I'm going to have to get something to satiate my rage. I'm going to have to get something. Which is it's interesting, because we go and we see that a lot in leaders. Oh well, yeah, very descriptive, beautifully descriptive language, very vivid. Very vivid, yes indeed. I'm going to need to be satiated. I'm not going to do this just for its own sake. Well, maybe I am, but I'm going to have a bad attitude about it. I'm going to make sure that other people wind up giving me my due. But ultimately, then, he winds up getting at least something of what he wants. But then the situation blows up in his face. To whom... To whom Achilles, matchless in the race, Atreides, glorious above all in rank, and as intent on gain as thou art great, when shall the Grecians give a prize to thee? The general stock is poor, the spoil of towns, which we have taken hath already passed in distribution, and it were unjust to gather it from all the Greeks again. But send thou back this virgin to her god, and when Jove's favor shall have given us Troy, a threefold, fourfold share shall then be thine. So Achilles is negotiating. And he puts this so nicely, you know, it's just, okay, how is this supposed to happen? We don't really have all that much to go around. We've already spread it out and we don't want to go and engender ill will amongst the people to whom we've given the spoils of war. But do what you got to do and... Just just wait a bit and you'll get a three or four portion three or four fold portion upon finally sacking Troy. So that's Achilles suggestion. And Achilles, I think, in so doing, what well, we can learn a lesson based on what happens next. To whom the sovereign of the host replied, Godlike Achilles, valiant as thou art, wouldst thou be subtle too, but me no fraud, shall overreach or art persuade of thine. Wouldst thou that thou be recompensed, and I sit meekly down, defrauded of my due? And didst thou bid me yield her, let the bold Achaeans give me competent amends, such as may please me, and it shall be well. Else if they give me none, I will command thy prize, the prize of Ajax, or the prize, it may be of Ulysses to my tent. And let the loser chafe, but this concern shall be adjusted at convenient time. Come, launch we now into the sacred deep, a bark with lusty rowers well supplied. Then put on board Chryseis, and with her, the sacrifice required go also one. High in authority, some counselor, Edomnius or Ajax, or thyself. Thou most untractable of all mankind, and seek by rites of sacrifice and prayer to appease Apollo on our host's behalf. So any prize is not enough for Agamemnon. Any prize won't satisfy him. He'll demand the prize of Achilles, the prize of Ajax, or the prize of Ulysses or Odysseus.
interesting how that all boils down. He's like, okay, we're going to do what needs to be done. But one of the three of you is going to give me your prize. Because I ain't going to do it for nothing. And due to the nature of his position, well, someone is going to draw the short straw. Somebody is going to get the bad end of the stick. Somebody is going to get screwed. And spoiler alert, that somebody is Achilles. Hence, the book beginning. Achilles sing, O goddess Pleia's son. His wrath pernicious, who ten thousand woes, caused to Achaia's host sent many a soul, illustrious into Hades premature. Pissing off Achilles was not a good idea. Pissing off Achilles was a very bad idea. Then not only do you wind up having the plague, which of course winds up dissipating, but then you wind up having your best warrior gone. You know, the, the whole idea of, uh, of um, Achilles is he had his heel. His mom would dip him in the river Styx, holding him by his heel and pull him out so that he wound up being connected still to life. Uh, but the river Styx made him invulnerable to anything else. Or at least that's how they explained his, his invulnerability and his being a good fighter. So you basically wound up with this guy that couldn't be beaten. Leaving the army, which we'll discuss in the following days stuff indeed the way Achilles responds to being wronged is quite telling uh, we, we learn a lot about Achilles already now and go back to slide 19 so Achilles goes and gives a, a pragmatic argument and in so doing draws the attention of the king to him. And I find myself often in this role. I find myself often having this kind of a problem. I find myself being the purveyor of practical advice, the, the purveyor of practical plan. And that means that due to the fact that I dare presume that I know what's going on and I dare propose something that may not be emotionally the most easily palatable thing I make enemies and I would suggest that many people who are thinking types many people who prefer to think or many people who are intuitive types, many people who prefer to intuit, many people that have a big grasp of the whole, can tend to go and tick people off. And there's a certain amount of wisdom that we can hopefully gain by looking at what happens when you open your mouth. Or at least what happens if you open your mouth in a certain way. Because Achilles is not subtle. He's not tactful. He, you see, he, he started by, by saying, we can't do this, we can't do this, we can't do this. And so Agamemnon is already mad. Agamemnon is already incensed. So when somebody's in that emotional state, you don't go try to do anything. You don't go and approach the person. You don't go and expect certain things out of them. Because when they're in that kind of emotional state, they will not be reasoned with. Reason doesn't enter the equation. All you ever, ever, all you'll ever going, all you will ever get is grudging compliance and sabotage. That's all you ever get. And that's another lesson we can learn from classical literature. 
it just winds up being kind of hidden in there. It winds up being implicit. It winds up getting hidden in the story arc as opposed to being explicitly stated as in a psychology textbook. So going and digging through the text like this will help us go and find a deeper truth. Oh yes, he's very abrasive. He's very abrasive. And interestingly, in certain aspects, he's the character I identify with the most. Now, maybe that's arrogant of me to say, but I, I think that the, the reason that these stories exist is because we all can find a character with whom we identify the most and then ultimately see that, yeah, a lot of this has to do with gods and fates and things like that, but the interaction between the characters, the dynamic of those things does not change. There is this basic human nature underlying the whole thing. There is this basic element of humanity and these basic elements of interaction that don't change over time. Now we know today that those kinds of interactions are largely mediated by the serotonin um, and, and, and our respective serotonin levels. Uh, our drive to power, our drive to our, our way of doing things, uh, what we value and how we go about getting them. And there are people that have stronger personalities and people that have weaker personalities and people that are abrasive, people that are smooth. A lot of these things are ingrained from us from a young age. A lot of them are innate, but a lot of them can be learned. It may feel fake at first, but you don't need to be abrasive Achilles if you can go and be someone else. You can go and look at these things, and even though it's uh, a lot of it is hyperbolic, though a lot of it is has has been um, removed from reality and refined over the years, the thing that remains is is ultimately some truth. So you can go and decide, I'm going to be like this person. You can take these literary figures as role models and be pretty certain you're going to get a certain response if you apply yourself in the similar context. Otherwise, it wouldn't have had the ring of truth. Otherwise, it would have gotten selected against by readers. Otherwise, the epic poem would be something else. But it's not something else because this is what stood the test of time. Yeah, human connection on a fundamental level. Exactly. And however much we may prefer that it, that, that it not all be contingent upon this human connection aspect, the human connection aspect is important. And... Allow me to say that I, I'm not just saying this. I, I am not just saying this at all. I've gotten better over the years, but I'm nowhere near perfect at this. I'm, insofar as people go, I may be reasonably good at it, but it's only because I've had enough practice and I've made enough mistakes. And by reasonably good, I mean, you know, average. Or less. It's like I, I've made progress in the past decade. We'll just we'll just go with that. Yeah, at, at least all all other things being equal, which they're not necessarily. My 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 interpersonal skills are not the best. I mean, if we go and do Myers Briggs, I'm an INTJ. That 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 that, that already is like I'm shooting myself in the foot. At least an ENTJ would have the certain set of abilities in order to, to just force their will through, whereas I'm more like, well, it's, unless it's absolutely worth it, I'm not going to go for it. So, 
either way, um, there are certain things that don't require other people. Uh, there are certain things we can do in life that don't necessitate other people's participation. And these things that don't necessitate others' participation, we can just go and, and, and do them ourselves. Um, and I'm saying this assuming that most of us here in this stream are, are watching the stream, participating there in our introverts. Uh, some of us may be extroverts and may have a much easier, much, much, much easier time than I have. Uh, and if you do, then please do share. But for those of us who are introverted, those who us, those of us who prefer to sit back and analyze, those who, of us who prefer to kind of intuit and just, you know, take a backseat role, realize that, like it or not, we are human beings. We are herd animals. And at least to some extent, we require the herd. Almost without fail. The only way we don't is if we're a hermit. And we, of course, have more technology nowadays than before. But we are still interconnected. And so, you know, maybe instead of being Achilles, you could be... I mean, Patroclus is kind of like the fool, but, yeah, but he's no dummy. Um, could be uh, Hector. You could be Agamemnon. Now, being Agamemnon, it would be for me to be a very stressful role to play. I'm not that aggressive. Yeah, I despise that notion too. And it's actually very, very, it's the school of hard knocks that has forced me to concede it. A school of hard knocks has, 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 fo has forced me to concede that. I have unnecessarily made enemies by the way I've chosen to say things and to whom I've chosen to say them. I'm not saying that some, some things don't need to be said. I'm just saying that sometimes it behooves one to have patience with one's fellow man. Sometimes it behooves one to craft a less powerful argument from a logical sense in order to appeal to people emotionally. Or, if we go and we look at the elements of pathos, ethos, and logos, use all three. I tend to jump straight to logos. I, I tend to stick with logic. I tend to stick with that which reasonably leads to another thing. I can go and make logically compelling cases, but I generally do it dispassionately, which I've been working on. In fact, I find that after reading poetry, I can be more passionate, which is another reason I'm doing this whole thing in poetry rather than in prose, is I, I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it because reading the poetry... Getting myself in that frame of mind allows me to be more compelling. So that, you know, when my kids see these videos, uh, hopefully they'll be like, hey, Dad actually said something good. I can listen to it. As opposed to, you know, getting bored and tooting it out. So there's the, there's, there's the, there's the, there's the pathos. And there's the ethos. And this is ultimately the reason that Sleaze bags get ahead. I know that this 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 comes as probably a shock that ethos, ethics, the, the the actually being good is the reason sleaze bags get ahead. But it's because the people that are good are honest. The people that are good are honest. The people that are actually good are honest. Which means we can go and admit our faults. We can go and admit the faults in ideas. We can go and see things in shades of gray where shades of gray are. Whereas, you can wind up having some Dunning-Kruger lunk-headed moron coming up and saying, I'm good. I'm everything you need. I'm this, 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 this. And because it's portrayed confidently, 
and because they have a squeaky clean image, which they've just gone and, 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 and cultivated over time, like it's not necessarily substantial, it's just a cultivated image, people listen to it. And the thing that used to bother me, and still does bother me, but to a lesser extent, is that that image makes a difference. Image is everything. Because people operate based upon what they perceive. And we as human beings have all sorts of heuristics. That when we only have limited energy to go around, we only have limited mental faculty to go around. We go and we pick up on these, on these, on on these things that ultimately have been. If we wouldn't have picked up on them, humanity wouldn't have survived. Is this person wearing a suit? Well, extra points for him in terms of, uh, in terms of ethos. Right? Does this person, you know, kiss children? Extra points in terms of ethos. Is this person passionate about what he's doing? Extra points to Barack Obama. You know, just looking and understanding these other aspects, that logos, and making appeals to them and through them can be helpful. Can be very helpful. So you don't need to abandon logos if that's your go-to mode. But start with pathos and start with ethos and then finally lead to logos so that you wind up taking the hard to swallow pill and coating it with a little sugar. Hard to swallow pills are still pills and they help. But, you know, I think it's in Mary Poppins, just a spoon full of sugar makes the medicine go down. You know, they, they have songs like that for a reason. That's, that's another one of the things that's going to stand the test of time. I guarantee you in two, three, five, five hundred thousand years, uh, as long as the medium is still around, people are going to remember uh, uh, Mary Poppins. Just a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down in the most delightful way. And notice that, that, was, that that's even in musical form. And interestingly, you had in the ancient days, what did you have? Who were the storytellers? They were the bards. They were the people that were plucking on their stringed instruments and telling a story in with, with meter and with, with, with music. They, they were the people that, that wound up having a command over word, over number, over time, over notes. They were the people that were classically educated according to the liberal arts, and they wound up having an influence on the world. And those, are, those skills are equally important even now because we can go and apply them to what we're doing, whether or not we're using computers, whether or not we're using technology. That's irrelevant. The medium is far less relevant than the message. Now, the medium helps the message get across, but if the message falls flat itself, then it doesn't matter what kind of cool thing we have for propagating it. It's just not going to be worth anything. So putting ourselves into the position of the hearer and the position of the listener and doing what needs to take place regardless of how it makes us feel about it, regardless of how much we feel like we're a sellout because we're not just making a logical appeal, those kinds of things ultimately do need to be done if we want to get anywhere in life. Yeah, aesthetics. Oh yes. People shatter under the pressure of logic and simply cannot bear it. I suppose that's why people depend on pathos, yes. Aesthetics are profoundly effective. Image dominates over reason. People are susceptible to things that satisfy their sight. Absolutely. And I, I think that your previous point brings up something very, very interesting about the dependency on pathos. <coughs> Ultimately... And, and, and this is going to be, um, I don't think my friend would want to be named, but he and I had an argument a couple years ago 
it almost it was it was almost three years ago now in which uh, he basically gave me um, Kahneman's uh, thinking fast and slow I think it was thinking fast and slow and he was arguing that every single decision that we make is an emotional decision at the core of it uh, it's just that the different things that put us into particular frames of mind are different from person to person it's like for example you don't perceive me as being too much of a foreigner you don't perceive me as being too much of a weirdy I mean I am a weirdy and and and, and probably everybody watching the stream is also weird or, or at least finds that in some way they don't fit in with with what the norm is and there's at least some element of understanding there's the element that you know that I do care about logic and if you care about logic then I can somehow regardless of whether we are starting with the same presuppositions we can go and bring ideas to the table we can think we can talk we can reason together now come now let us reason together and for somebody who feels safe in the world of logic and reason that makes what I'm saying more palatable to you and that makes what you're saying more palatable to me but ultimately if, if neither of us were feeling safe in this kind of an interaction this interaction would be at best very very disjointed and at worst would not take place at all or would turn into something cancerous and toxic it just so happens that the key to keeping me emotionally balanced and the key to keeping you emotionally balanced is very different than the key that it takes to to keep some other people emotionally balanced but and here's the but if we do what we normally would do and add to it the pathos and the ethos that means we don't alienate each other we don't alienate the logical folks in so doing we rather wind up becoming more inclusive in our words and wind up becoming more effective when we speak or write And at least in so far as, as as my preparation goes, that's about all I have regarding these first 182 lines of. Or did I say 182? And 182 lines of of the Iliad. And I'm going to now put the timer on and we're gonna have an eight minute intermission and I'm going to hope that if you guys are interested that you would um, write down your thoughts in the chat while during the intermission so that we'll be able to have it all sitting there and then refer there back to it after the intermission is over So we have six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes. And that'll give us plenty of time to think about what's going on and plenty of time to um, to um, get our mindset on the rest of uh, on the stream. In the meantime, uh, thank you for tuning in uh, as far as you have, and see you on the other side.
Vater. Sorge Burger. Ah. What up? Uh. I don't know what is up. I got a ceiling up here. I'm assuming that you have uh, some other people up there. Some other people? How do you mean? I'm assuming, like, like I don't know what kind of a what kind of a place you're in. Are you like, are there floors above you? Are there floors below floors below you? Are the, is this a uh, split level, single uh, level? I'm on the ground floor. There's one guy above me. Oh, ah, okay. It's four four units in here. So just two on the ground and then two up on top. Right. So it's not like three on the ground and then a penthouse up top. I'm trying to rent a house at the moment. A house? Yeah, they're really cheap in the place in Ohio where I'm going, which I won't say on stream. But, um... Th there's a uh, for for about seven hundred to seven fifty a month you can get a little house. That's excellent. So you were bringing up a point. Yes. Uh, that I thought had quite a bit of merit. Uh, which I was I was guessing that you probably would say something along those lines if you were present. I didn't know whether you were present because you were nice and silent and all the rest of it. Um, I was present for much of it. So, the the whole um, Philios thing. I, I I really think that that that's a huge element of modern life that just com that gets almost completely thrown under the bus. It just gets disregarded. You know, people assume that. All love is either um, basically Rand's definition of um, not charity but altruism or Eros. So basically you wind up having all these demented definitions of love and caring and, and, and we don't anymore have the vocabulary to discuss the nature of human relations and when the vocabulary goes the expectation follows the way of the vocabulary and then the expectation ultimately goes and says hey we can't actually go and have deep meaningful connections without sexualizing everything or uh, we can't possibly you know love someone or, or understand altruism to be anything other than abject stupidity uh, and and uh, bright, starry-eyed ide uh, uh, idealism or naivety. You know, we, we wind up getting all these these really, really dumb ideas uh, on account of the fact that we have essentially crippled ourselves due to our lack of having any kind of real words to describe what's going on. Because... Uh, it's, it's like like what would like what like if I come and I say to you, "Hey Caleb, I love you, man. You're 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 such an awesome. You're like a brother to me." I'm sure that people uh, like people would kind of get it, and they would know that there's nothing going on between us. Don't let him lie to you guys. I totally <laughs> suck his dick constantly, literally. <laughs> yeah, this no, is, I'm just kidding. yeah yeah. My uh, it's four thousand three hundred miles long. And <laughs> just you see it, it just if you watch from space with a telescope you can see it streaking across the ocean. <laughs> okay, but then we, we could joke about this sort of a thing and it and it doesn't I mean, it, some people might get rubbed the wrong way about it, but the fact of the matter is that doesn't really matter to me. It's like, Caleb and I can have the dynamic between us. Any one of us in chat, you know, we have, what is Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So there's this idea 
that we can get along as siblings, as brothers and sisters. There, there, there's just this basic idea of how people get along. And because family life is so screwed up, we don't even necessarily, I mean, some of us may, some of us may not, but it's not a guarantee that we even have a healthy family life to compare things to. So it's like, well, why would I want a brother if all my brother's going to do is beat the shit out of me when I get home and give me a swirly? <laughs> or what have you. Or fuck your credit over by not paying the bills when you lived with them, and then you find out two years later when you try to buy a used car. Ah. I mentioned in passing, totally unrelated to any party's present. I'm, I'm, I'm... Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, it's, um, there are certain elements of interpersonal interaction that have been valued. And interestingly, many societies, you know, for betrayal, uh, uh, many more, uh, tribalistic societies would kill for far less than that. You go and, and demonstrate disloyalty. Well, sorry, there's a, there's a ditch over out back with a, uh, with a nice place for your head in it. And we'll feed your body to the wolves or something. I, there's, done. And there, there was a, a higher tolerance for certain things, like a higher tolerance for differences in between human beings. Because when you're, when you're staring down nature, then an awful lot of the things that fragment us today don't fragment us. But then there are a lot of things that we allow to happen to us. You know, this uh, lack of loyalty, uh, betrayal, that have become much more commonplace. And, and, it, and it's interesting because our reaction to those is, is, is ultimately that of our reaction to a threat. But you, it's... You can't just go and say, "Okay, kill the betrayer." Um, the you know the legal system doesn't provide for that. It's just like, "Okay, we'll just you, you you can isolate yourself, essentially exile the betrayer, and that works to some extent." But you, but there's a, a lot of the cause and effect that existed in one at one place and at one time don't exist today, and so we have to be even more careful with the words we choose and the people we choose to spend our time with and so on, uh, in terms of being able to generate for ourselves happy, healthy, interpersonal relationships. What's on your mind, Mr. Beers? I was thinking a bit about culture. You know, it, it seems to me, and... I, I, I think that, you know, I've gone on record several times saying that envy is one of the foremost vices of our time. That is to say that envy now is what perhaps greed was in the 1800s. I don't know. Could be. Uh, I, I don't know necessarily what the, what the preeminent vice of the 1800s was, but... But I would totally agree with you that envy is not. And then it's viewed, it's not viewed as a vice. It's not viewed as a bad thing. It's so common. You know, you know, Nietzsche said something that really stuck with me. He said that the vanity of others is counter to our taste only in so far as it is counter to our vanity. I guess that explains the certain in-groups that exist in society today, to a large part. Yes. People that can claim to be oppressed group up with people that can claim to be oppressed on similar terms. But, you know, there are degrees of oppression. Like, apparently now, uh, apparently now in certain circumstances and not in others you know Asians are now the biggest oppressors in academia right and then comes the white people and then and, and so on so 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 we've been we've been demoted 
uh, but but then we're still white and we're still male, so that means in other aspects of society we are we are still a, you know bigger oppressors than everyone than, else than, than everyone else. So so you know I, I feel like there's a leftist myth that goes on a, a very a very common leftist myth that is sort of like there's the oppressors and the oppressed, and you know the people on top are always the oppressive ones. Somebody's always being kept down, and it's the eternal job of uh, morally minded people to figure out who's on top and throw them down. Whereas I, I see it a little bit differently. I see this from a material standpoint as a case of a, from a material standpoint as a case of envy, but also as a case of a, of greed. You know, you if somebody has more than you do, if somebody has something that you do not, then that is an excuse in and of itself to take it from them. And you would much rather they lose it and nobody gets it. They lose their money or their property or whatever, and nobody gets it than, have your, than bring yourself up to their level. It's all about getting revenge on them. And the stuff about oppression and privilege and so forth is just an excuse to those ends. Indeed. Would you care to expound a little more? Well, for example, um, part of the issue is that of if we see a rich person right or let's say we see a guy driving a ferrari and we're in a car full of people on the highway we see a ferrari go by i guarantee you that in 99 percent of cases if i'm in a car full of people and i start to sneer at the guy in the ferrari and talk about how he's an asshole for even owning that car um i will get the approval of the other people. Oh, you'll get virtue points. You'll get virtue points. What an asshole for having something I don't. And we had an interesting conversation around the dinner table about that uh, just last night. Oh, yes? Mm-hmm. And it, it was interesting because the whole thing, I mean, it, 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 was, it was a bigger mess. Um... It, it was perhaps bigger and more complicated than I, than I'm 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 letting on based on this on this on this conversation. But at least for the you know uh, associated with the point that you're trying to make, there were certain assumptions carried by certain members, certain participants in the in the conversation, um, namely that. Uh, you know, there's there's a general idea that there's a certain amount of money that one should basically not try to exceed, or try not to exceed, or, yeah, or, or try not to exceed, especially yes. So um, there are people, I, and I would I would actually say. My wife's family and my family, both of them, uh, we have family members that occupy every single rung of the economic ladder except for perhaps the nine-figure net worth. Uh, so, so, we, so we have the spectrum of, of like, don't get a paycheck and we'll get kicked out to very, very, very wealthy uh, could afford pretty much anything uh, whenever uh, <clears throat> whenever he wants it. And anyhow, this, this, this person wound up being uh, a wealthy person wound up being uh, in a job wherein one of the junior members was making less than other people. So uh, he quit. Was searching for greener pastures. And immediately the idea of, of most of the people around the table was that, well, why in the world would anyone quit a job making a, essentially the equivalent of 110000 a year? Well, I mean, if everyone else is making three hundred. But but they, but but they, but they were basically saying, okay, why would why why would somebody be so 
so ungrateful. And you know, he shouldn't even be making 110 a year. He's not doing that much. He's not he's not he's not doing that much. He's just working in finance. He's just typing a few he's punching buttons on the computer and whatever. Uh essentially insinuating that if I had such a cushy job, I would be satisfied. But if I know anything about human nature, it wouldn't be. If you're not going to be satisfied with uh, 20000 a year, which will keep you past the point of starvation, you're not going to be satisfied with 120 or $2 million. Uh, there's this thing of always having your eyes fixated on the next thing. And, and going and, and saying that, well, I have so much less and therefore it's okay if I want some, if I want triple my salary, but if someone already has more than triple my salary, they can't conceivably want triple their salary. So, 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 so there's this, this, this idea that ultimately, uh, whether we like it or not, and we're not going to say it out aloud because that's, that's, that's just a little bit too much, but if we're all climbing up a totem pole, I can think of very few people nowadays that aren't at least somewhat okay with the idea of chopping the totem pole off right above the level of our own head. And what's really corrosive about this is the fact that it's disguised using hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is one of the most baffling defenses that uh, one person can use against another. Because you're talking, you know, that you can talk out of your ass, as it were, about equality and about fairness and so on, when really all you're doing is trying to attack the people who have more than you do so you can be on top. Yes, but the reason that it works is due to the fact that society is essentially a Pareto distribution. You can appeal to 80% of people by ostracizing 20%. Now, that's assuming that <coughs> the 80% is just as uh, immoral as you. Uh, but, but it's very, very easy to marginalize the rich or the intelligent, or the people who are at the very, very extreme, the most athletic, the most attractive, the, the, the people that are one or two standard deviations above the mean or more. Well, so we'll, we'll just say plus two standard deviations on, especially plus three. Plus three is really, really bad. Once you get to plus three standard deviations in any realm, you set yourself up for getting a world of hate. Whether it's intelligence, which you can't do anything about, or wealth, which I suppose you can. Uh, whether it has to do with your looks, which I you you have a certain amount of. I mean, like if you're not eating a gallon of ice cream every night and complaining about your thyroid, and instead you're you know working out and doing things to take care of yourself, you're quickly going to go and at least be one or two standard deviations above the average in terms of your looks. Unless you're just ugly like me, in which case, well, you're pretty pretty much out of luck anyway. And that is why self-deprecation works. That is why self-deprecating humor is among the most well-received types. Because people want to feel like they're on top. And if you can go and play the fool, and you can go and make people feel good around you, they will feel good around you because they're getting their ego stroked by you. That's why brown nosing works. It's very transparent, but it works because of people's status monkey, their serotonin, and how fragile it is. Yes. Another thing. I think that Confucius has something really interesting to say here. Confucius at one point says, he sort of sighs and says, let me actually, you know what, let me grab my copy. I thought that the shelf, uh, if, if I recall correctly, you said something about um, that bookshelf being full of a bunch of books with blank pages. Well, I'm going to pretend to read from this one. Okay. All right, let me see if I can find it here. Take your time. Um, he says at one point, 
Let me see if there's an index here. Why do none of these frickin' books ever have an index? You would expect philosophy of all things to have a damned index. I don't know, maybe people just expect that you remember exactly where everything is. I mean, if you go and you Let think about see. how much our own how how much our brains are fed information upon information upon information. Uh, you know, people had less to remember back when these things were originally written. Even if they were only written 20 years ago, people had a whole lot less to remember. And so they would be able to remember better where things are. Like I know Christians that used to be able to know where certain verses were located throughout the Bible and can't do that anymore, even though they once were able to do it because their head is so much full, full of so much more clutter than they were a couple decades ago. Right. Well, at one point, Confucius says that he wishes he didn't have to speak and that people would just fall into... Uh, fall into line around him because of his virtue, the way that all of the stars orbit around the pole star when you see them go a ring around it in the sky. Now here's the thing, Confucius is not being egotistical there, because what he's saying is that the people on top, when they are virtuous, when some the people, and I don't, I'm not talking about the social hierarchy here, I'm talking about the Pareto distribution. When the people on top of the Pareto distribution are virtuous enough, they draw other people into their orbit naturally. And I think a large amount of the decline of the West um, is not just due to, so to speak, prole revolt or slave revolt, as we might have it, slave morality, or, the, or you know, the little uh, tyrant, little guy making himself a tyrant. It's largely because of our authorities losing their virtue or the decay of our authorities to the point where nobody trusts them anymore. Who trusts anything anyone in the humanities says about culture or about civilization nobody nothing they say even matters they're caught up in internal dialogue um and they no longer say anything of relevance to the rest of the world more more to the point though there's there's this feeling that all of our the people at the top of the parado the, the people at the top of the hierarchies are not the people at the top of the parado distributions and the people at the top of the parado distributions are being kept out of the hierarchies which is why we have to make new ones Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how many of the Pareto distributions uh, have considerable overlap. Right. So there are, and I believe you said something about this, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, I think that you said something about this last March in a stream, uh, where, where you were talking about that, that people that climb to the top, I think we were actually talking about Hitler, if I'm not mistaken how they might not necessarily be holistically virtuous, but at least by the fact that they were able to climb to the top of some hierarchy, they had to have had some sort of virtue. And that's you know kind of predicated upon an Aristotelian understanding of uh, what constitutes virtue and how it relates to other things in life. Did I, uh, am I getting at least to the essence of what you were saying? Right. Yay, I didn't forget what you said. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, the aim of it is to uh, make a more virtuous society or a more interesting one. Not more interesting one, excuse me. A more virtuous society or one where quality is higher you know, a, a, a more qualitative society and less of a quantitative one. And part of that involves taking um, taking the taking, taking it upon yourself to do the long hard work of, first of all, to give up on the old hierarchies and to do the long hard work of building new ones that will either subsume or uh, subvert or subjugate the old hierarchies. The old political, academic, uh, media hierarchies, all of these things. And media is the place to start because, um, that, you know, the capturing the popular mind is a big part of it, and that's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting that you would w wind up needing to have 
the, the, ultimately two guys from Ohio, <laughs> two guys from Ohio talking like this, bringing up Kant, bringing up Homer, bringing up what constitutes a classical education, bringing up the liberal arts in the way they were originally done, not, you know, this whole progressive liberal arts department BS that the universities have been cramming down people's throats for a generation and a half minimum. We'll say three generations minimum. Uh, and, and, and fortunately, the medium exists for us to be doing this. The fact of the matter is, if you go and you look at how many people are watching your videos, Caleb, it's already more than many liberal arts classes. Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, like you have you have a it's, bigger microphone than do teachers that are working in the current institutions of higher education. And more to the point, you know, if a hundred people watch one of my videos, that's about twenty-five times as many. You know, by a factor of twenty-five, that's greater than the number of people who read the average article in a journal. Yeah, and the ones yeah. who read it in the journal will probably never cite it or use it for anything other than producing more horse shit. And, and additionally, uh, uh, to to what you were saying there, Caleb, um, if you think about people that wind up having, for example, going to a liberal arts university to study something real, like a, a subject that will actually give them some sort of financial compensation, you know, like engineering or science or uh, math or, or, or business or medicine or or what have you but then have a, have a general ed liberal arts requirements a lot of people just are there to get a grade right the people that are watching your videos are watching it because they actually care about what you're saying so that means you wind up having more of a captive audience the people that interact with this kind of stuff on youtube are the kinds of people that care about important things and are willing to go and fill their minds with all these sorts of things that maybe uh, you know your average university student wouldn't be willing to do and, and so right. so so the, so the yield is even higher given the fact that the people that wouldn't do it aren't doing it right it's a huge blessing precisely and uh, nothing, you know, there, there's a passage of Beyond Good and Evil where Nietzsche says, The disappointed one speaks. I listened for the echoes and heard only praise. Ah, and that brings, yet up an, and that brings up yet another point. What interpersonal and social tropes crop up in the Iliad that are instructive for us today? Righteous anger. Ah, there we go. Righteous anger. Which today is basically, it comes in the form of a faux righteous indignation with the check your privilege squad, but what have you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah, but that particular, it does provide impetus. It provides energy. It can feel like... Do not let the sun go down here. So don't let it consume you. But it's interesting that even the Bible, out of out of all the books that might correct it, doesn't go out and say that anger is actually bad. Bad. Right. And then you can go and see, okay, uh, spoiler alert for those of you that haven't read the Iliad, so uh, Achilles quits. Achilles just gets Achilles just gets up and leaves the army, and then everything goes to crap. His buddy Patroclus, which is a, another person, I would I would say that the Philios is really there because Achilles and Patroclus were close. They were good friends, you know, kind of like the David and Jonathan dynamic of the Bible, and you can find this interspersed throughout good literature. Is that you know the 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 protagonist winds up having a really good friend, and. Well, in the case of Jonathan in the Bible, he basically wound up uh, dying in a war and being unable to uh, inherit a kingdom. In the case of Patroclus, he wound up pretending to be Achilles, leading the army into battle and dying. Uh, 
but so but then Achilles goes and sees his friend dead. And whatever wrath he may have had in book one that caused him to leave was magnified. It was amplified. He's like, okay. Uh, it was partially anger at himself. Like, why did I leave and let my friend lead an army that he couldn't lead to die? Why did I do that? And why in the world did all this, thing, all this stuff go wrong? Why? Just feeding it, fueling it, fueling it, fueling it, fueling it. But instead of turning in and becoming self-destructive, he just went out and won a war. Righteous anger. We can be righteously angry, but that doesn't mean that we need to go and behave immorally on account of it. We just use it as fuel for an appropriate fire. Use it as fuel for the appropriate goals. People people get caught up in it. I mean, if we were talking about the, the uh, pathos and the ethos, that just goes and completely fuels the pathos, which allows the ethos to come more, come out more because people become more articulate when they're mad. Or at least they dare articulate things better when they're mad. They dare go and say, this is the point that I'm coming from. This is, I do have the moral high ground. And I do have the, I just, and then all the pieces just come together. Righteous indignation, righteous anger can channel people's efforts like few other things can do. Yes. And I think that part of the, the main problem that the reason that people get stuck in a rut is because they don't can't figure out how to link their negative emotions to the appropriate action. And I'm actually kind of channeling Matt here when I speak this way. Uh, is they cannot figure out how to link their negative emotions to the appropriate action. You feel bad because you're fat. If every time you felt bad over being fat, you decided to get up and do 10 jumping jacks, you wouldn't be fat very long. But, and, you know, you might have the motivation to do 10, 10 jumping jacks a day and then trail off after three days because you don't have the motivation for it, and then you go back to feeling bad about it. The key is getting that feeling bad about being fat linked to an action that gets rid of the source of that emotion. You know, sometimes I'll go ahead and unbutton a little bit. You know, I'm not a person who has a... Uh, the healthiest self-image as a result of my upbringing. So one thing that happens to me is that when I am feeling kind of shitty about things, I compulsively clean and groom myself. Because it makes me feel better and it ultimately improves my circumstances because one has more self-respect when one's surroundings and one's body are well kept. Certainly. And, and one additionally can increase one's serotonin levels by consistently doing things to increase one's status which therefore starts to feed an upward cycle right hence why I want to have a house even if it's a crappy one instead of an apartment mm -hmm. hence why I'm trying to get a new car mm -hmm. it's stuff that I hate normally this all this status BS but it's a game I have to play and if I'm gonna play it then I'm gonna dominate at it um, you know, it, it, one thing that occurred to me at one point in life was, uh, when I was very depressed was, why haven't I ended it all yet? And what I thought to myself was, well, because I haven't gotten even yet. <laughs> you know, when I get to, uh, surge far past, climb past like a maniac, climb up this cliffside and leave everybody else in the dirt and then come back with the trophy and throw it in their faces, then, then it'll be okay. But until then, I refuse to die. Ah. I don't care if I get cancer, it will be a medical miracle. I can't believe he's still alive and he's still making money. Because I refuse to die until I get to throw it in their faces. The, uh, the thing, and I've, and I've found this about having had the opportunity to throw things in people's faces, because, you know, how, how, however much things may have... I, I don't know why, I, I just tend to draw the ire of people very easily. So, <laughs> so the, the the difficulty is I've I've never 
been able to throw things in people's faces. Meaning, it's like I get to the point where I could. I get to the point where I've explicitly and very, very unequivocally proven that person wrong. And then it's like, you look at the person that was trying to yank you down and trying to ruin you and trying in every conceivable way. You go and you see how pathetic they are. And you don't care to throw it in their faces anymore because they just don't matter. Yep. Yes. Get, getting to that point, it's not that it's apathy. It's just that you realize, well, this is completely worthless. I mean, I'm not going to be doing anybody any good by bringing it up. And if I do wind up getting revenge in that way, it'll be hollow. Bird plus one virtue. Mm hmm And it's interesting because it's it's is is touting virtue from a point of weakness versus being virtuous from a point of strength are two completely different things. And I'm fully aware that on some level I'm lying to myself. I'm not really going to take the trouble to go back and throw it in their faces, but if I tell myself that in a moment of rage, I find that I do great things. And at least you would know that you have essentially the high ground to be able to do that. Right. Should you so choose. You would know... Right. You Exactly. You would know that if I get into that position, if I so chose, I could go throw it in their faces and they couldn't say anything. Or they could try. Then you could just laugh in their faces and then they would just have to look inside of themselves and scream in despair because they know you're right. Yeah. Feeling very INTJ saying that. Well, maybe it's ENTJ. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's actually what that is. Have you, that's the ENTJ's shadow talking. Have you read uh, Mr. Alan Lobo's answer about revenge? <laughs> <laughs> would you like to read that, Caleb? Will would. you read that for the for the uh, for the stream? <laughs> I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. One minute. I'll put it on the... Um, is living well really the best revenge? And I will uh, copy the link and put it in the chat for you guys to open up in a new tab if you're interested. This guy follows me. I'm flattered. I'm not surprised. Not even close, he says. No revenge is sweeter than sheer raw payback. As a disclaimer, I acknowledge that this is not everyone's cup, but for better or for worse, I speak here of what I feel sincerely for my enemies. <laughs> In metaphorical terms, to strike down the man who has sinned so grievously against you, to put your boot to his throat, to then press on it and whisper in his ear, Know this much, that the only thing greater than your pain is the pleasure it gives me to see you suffer. I am not of the forgiving kind, and I take no pleasure in saying that because I am fully aware that the kind of men who are able to let go are morally far better than a soul like me. And it is ironically for that reason that I can sometimes let go of injuries inflicted on me, because I know the kind of person I am, and I know that men like me often deserve no sympathy. But those sins and wounds inflicted on good, innocent, and trusting people who I consider as my own and love passionately, no, that kind of malevolence I can never let go. Ever. That vengeance is as visceral and it is permanent. To wound souls like mine is par for the course sometimes, but to go after the kind and trusting ones is, in my book, to seek perdition. Amen. It is to ask for and then deserve what's coming to them. I simply cannot forgive those wickedly inflicted wounds, not mere slights, but deliberate and purposeful efforts to harm them. In a Freudian sense, it is a twisted form of payback to men who I fully understand the nature of. These men have then richly earned an enmity which is as deeply vindictive as it will be perpetual. Living well, then? That's a bonus. Honestly speaking, it is merely tangential in my eyes. Nothing is as satisfying as inflicting sheer pain on them and watching them suffer. The slower and more prolonged it is, all the better. It is hard for many people to conceptualize that the anger and desire for revenge isn't even hot and passionate, but cold and hardened. 
to the point that when the reckoning finally arrives, it does not even give me as much pleasure as it does satisfaction, like some task ticked off. Living well might be a win-win. It is probably even the wiser choice, but believe me when I say it doesn't even come anywhere near the closure and satisfaction of old-fashioned vengeance. And it's interesting what pushes him to the point. It, 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 it's, it's not that, like, he realizes how, how pathetic people are that try to mess with him. And he can let that slide. If it's somebody who is innocent and in, is trusting... Weak, naive, trusting my mom. <laughs> yeah, if, 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 exactly. if someone messes with my mom, if someone messes with my wife, if someone messes with my grandma, they will have hell to pay. If someone messes with my dad, I'm not worried about him. My dad can take care of himself. I don't care if he's freaking 95 years old. I'm not worried about him. If someone messes with my brother, I might be a little bit more defensive, but I'm not worried about him either. But look, I'm sexist. I would come to the defense of my mother. I would come to the defense of my grandmother, my wife. I would come to the defense of 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 my children. My daughter more so than my son. And I'll bet you if you looked at Alan Lobo, it would, the people on his list of people that would cause him to go and take sweet revenge, to put his boot on the throat of the person and say what it what is it that he said the know this much that the only thing greater than your pain is the pleasure it gives me to see you suffer I, that that's what happens when you days. that's what happens when you mess with someone uh, that a powerful person cares about and especially if you're doing it from the wrong position. I mean, I'll bet he could be an awful lot more understanding of somebody. Well, either way, I, I was just saying that it, 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 this reminds me of something that I was writing. It was a very, very small bit of a, of a, of a much broader context. But it had to do with homeschooling. And it had to do with the argument for and against homeschooling. And it went something like this. I was answering a question that asks, why are parents allowed to homeschool their kids? To teach in the public school system, teachers have to learn child development, show proficiency in their area, and be certified. But anyone can homeschool their kids. And I went and gave some context. I answered the question, but then I, I, I went and started to rant. And I'll read you one paragraph from that. Firstly, I take issue with the question itself. The government cannot allow me to homeschool my children. They are my children. My wife and I are their stewards, not the state. It is our responsibility to ensure that they grow up ready to make decisions by themselves. And it is our right to homeschool them if we deem it best. No central planner, no matter how well-intentioned, knows our children better than we do. And I'd rather live in no man's land under a tree than give up my right to care for my children. The fact of the matter remains that, objectively speaking, you will find perhaps a handful of people in the entire world better qualified than my wife and me to raise and educate our children. And no one who is better equipped due to us knowing and loving them since before they were born. If anyone wishes to attempt to deprive my wife or me of our right to care for our children, he will have hell to pay. Gone will be my patience. Gone will be my tolerance. Gone will be any shred of goodwill. And all that will remain is a burning desire to foil whoever has set out, conscientiously or not, to ruin the lives of my children. It's the exact same thing just brought into one concrete context precisely and it's funny because i can always make excuses for other people when they hurt me i should have known better shouldn't have been so trusting should have been a little more shrewd 
if it's someone I care about, and and for me, it's not so much hurting someone naive or trusting, and perhaps it's a place where I differ from either you or Mr. Lobo. For me, it's more along the lines of screwing over somebody who does nothing but good. And this is why I hate envy so much. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's like the, the, the thing from uh, Fiddler on a Roof. If I were a rich man... I mean, what is that but a reflection of one's own self? Assuming that if I were a rich man, I would do this. That's why you're not a rich man. <laughs> uh, you stupid, ugly, lazy, fat, retarded, and entitled bum. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's like, so, so people go and put themselves into the shoes of somebody else without realizing that perhaps someone might need to be more virtuous in order to get to that particular point. And the reason that they're not there is because they haven't cultivated what it takes to get there. But the higher you climb, the more pot shots people take at you. And that's just a fact. I'm going to send you some lyrics, Matt. And it's funny because I was listening to this song today and I thought to myself, this is a one minute snapshot of whatever is going on in Lina's head at any given second. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I can't wait. Let's see here. See if I can find wrath. You. Says Mr. Lego. Go ahead. I'm going to send this on WhatsApp. Okay. And uh, you can read these lyrics out loud. Oh. This is just a one minute snapshot of what I imagine is your thought process in any given time, Matt. Yay. I click on that. Why did you send me a virus, you turn? No. <laughs> no. Caleb, this is just a bunch of scenes from Rambo, all the gory parts pasted together. Yes, inside your head. Go ahead and read it, though. Oh, boy. No, man, you can't do that. You are a parasite, stupid and fat. Wrecking what is good to profit fast, then make your escape with blood-covered cash. You'll never stop. You will always lie. Everything you touch will wither and die. Life of denial. Nothing is true. No solution except to kill you. No man, no problem, no man, no problem. Dictators are usually right. They always know it's better to fight. Morons don't change, they only destroy. Treating the world like a personal toy. Education is a hopeless goal, better to teach with a bullet hole. Stack up the bodies to cover with dirt, then maybe we'll see what society's <laughs> worth. No man, no problem. No man, no problem. <laughs> it's like when, when, when Mr. Lina is having a bad day... <laughs> The inside of your head is just that played on repeat. Yeah, and and, and ultimately, it, you know, dealing with dealing with that, and dealing with the fact that there actually might be more than just a grain of truth to it, and and still having this compulsion to act virtuously in spite of it, it's, I'll admit, a struggle. It always is, but I think the virtue pays off in the end, in the long run. I hope so. Going through the long final analysis, if not you, then your grandchildren, eventually this propagates, because uh, one thing I found about the world is that might doesn't make right, but right makes might. Eventually. Eventually, in the long run, right makes might. The wheels of justice grind slowly. But they grind. Yeah, they grind yeah. nonetheless. They grind nonetheless. They don't stop. It's, uh, at least for somebody as impatient as me, very difficult to deal with taking the time to, um, wait for the wheels of justice to grind. No, oh, yes. I, I do remember, though, that one time uh, I was reading the verse from Ecclesiastes, or uh, Proverbs, rather. Wisdom crieth aloud in the streets, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. 
And as I was doing so, uh, I, I distinctly remember... I distinctly remember you picked up a spoon that you had... You picked up a spoon and began clanking it against a bowl, like, ding, ding, ding. Mm -hmm. And I just smiled because I knew what that was supposed to represent. That was a clock ticking. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an old gospel song along those lines called Run On. Johnny Cash did a lovely cover of it. You can run on for a long time. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. And it's the same idea as the idea that you can have these errors and this evil, and even if you personally get away with it, ultimately your influence gets purged out. Yeah. It ultimately gets purged out. Yeah, what what ultimately stands the test of time? What are we reading about in the history books? Who do we recognize as being evil? Who do we the recognize losers. as being good? The winners. Mm hmm And they say, you know, history is written by the victor. Well, why? Why did they win? And, you know, I'm not saying that bad people never end up on top. Certainly they do, but. You don't see Hitler uh, having, I mean, people, I guess, read Mein Kampf. But it's not Hitler's narrative that has prevailed. No. And it's not going to be Marx's or Lenin's or Stalin's or Khrushchev's, or any or any of their narratives either, or Castro's, or, or, or Guevara's, or, or, or Bernie Sanders. Their narrative is not going to prevail. It may wind up prevailing for a time, it may wind up becoming popular, but the fact of the matter is, the wheels of justice will grind through that too. Indeed. As Legolas says, morality will emerge victorious. And virtue shows up on top. And I love how Aristotle goes and basically, uh, in, in no uncertain terms, associates virtue with happiness. And he also says that good things have a tendency to prevail over their opposites. Mm-hmm. He does, and then in terms of, and he brings up in, um, well, he hates sophists. He <laughs> he despises sophists. And I think that we have a lot to learn from that particular idea. It's interesting, because sophists actually use the same tools that he uses, but it's just that what, everything that they're doing is predicated either on nothingness or on crap which means it can sound good and it can gain hearers for a time but then once people start to realize that it's nothing but emptiness it's nothing but vacuous it's nothing but terrible then eventually they'll wind up turning to the truth And that's why, at least on this stream, we're not too afraid of arguing or angering people by, by, by saying what uh, there is. I mean, here we have underneath our pictures, it says right here what it is that we're doing. We're not being, we're, we're not being <laughs> anyhow covert about it. We're pursuing the good, the true, and the beautiful by systematically pushing the limits of taboo thought. And interestingly, th those limits keep on encroaching upon us, so we constantly need to push them back. We're not talking about anything new. There is nothing new under the sun. But because these limits keep on encroaching on us, because political correctness takes precedence over truth, because people prefer to live in a delusion, and they'll attempt to do so for as long as they conceivably can, that means we need to push back harder and harder the more it winds up becoming an encroachment. By the way, the parlor schedule is going to change, just so you know. When? If you want to change... Um, well, this Friday, I'll be off. 
then I'm going to work Saturday through Wednesday, and then from then on, I'll be off Thursday and Friday. So I will have Thursday and Friday, and Friday in parlors. Great. Um, do you mind? Uh, so, 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 so you're saying up through next Wednesday, so like a week from tomorrow, and then after that, it's going to be Thursdays and Fridays off. Right. Okay. Understood. Um, would you like to plan some logistics around that in terms of a parlor and calling sacred cows participation, or would you like to do that off stream? Uh, we can do that off stream if you don't mind. I don't mind at all. Um, but what I wanted to say. Hang on just a moment. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to say was that on I'll be working a fairly late shift, uh, 2.30 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. Mm. And these typically, calling sacred cows, it goes 9, 10, 11 to midnight. Uh, so I wouldn't be uh, home. Typically. But, but we can, wouldn't weekends, home are different than, weekends are different than weekdays. And I'll, and I'll get rid of the uh, Friday late CSC. If that's the case, and I would push it to Saturday. Sounds good. We can just swap it around. Make sure we both have a good streaming schedule. Uh, apologies for so few Quora answers and so little content from me outside of Doom, which is one of the only things I really have the energy to do because uh, I've been in training for a new position at work for the past few weeks, and I'm on top of being in training. It's this exhausting mid shift where I have no time for anything i work 10 a.m to 7 p.m and i have an hour drive each way so it just eats up all my time so slow from In nine to eight world. you're okay so that's th how i mean it'd be better 5 a.m to 1 p.m right or 1 a.m <laughs> or or well, 5 p.m to 1 a.m i'll be working 2 30 to uh 10 30 or 11 was it 11 30 okay so you and, an I'll, and i'll also once i move closely once I move closer to work, then I'll get another hour of my day back. So, you know, I'd be leaving at 2 and getting back at midnight. Yeah, that ain't bad. I I did right. that I did that shift for a good long while during grad school. Right. I also did 5.15 in the evening to 1.15 in the morning. I actually preferred that a little bit, except for that the fact that I didn't get that good amount of sleep in between 12 and 2. But either way, second shift is, you know, it, you have the morning. You at least have the morning. And, and if your job doesn't require that much mental effort, you can, you can block out your good five hours in the morning for doing something worthwhile. <clears throat> at least I find that I, you know, in between four and nine in the morning is my, it, it's my prime time. It's my go time. Right, and my plan is to sleep something like 1 a.m. to 8 a.m., so between 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, those six hours, I have plenty of time. That's awesome. And I'll be able to do some streams and, you know, on Thursday and Friday off to do more stuff. Yay. Yay. This seems to be winding down. We've been going for 2 hours, 21 minutes, and 50 seconds. Or rather, that's what that timer says. We've been, for some reason, this one reset. So this one says 1 hour 55, 156. So either way, thank you very much, especially to you, Mr. Legolas Bowmaster, for tuning in the entire time. And uh, thank you to all of you who watched this after the fact. Uh, tune in tomorrow. We're going to continue uh, with the Iliad book one to begin our, our 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 stream and then we're going to go into other topics just as usual and thank you mr beers for uh joining so very quickly on such an impromptu basis you're welcome 
mean, this is that's all we have for now, guys. See ya. Until next.